the session on postdocs and PhDs and the diverse career pathways. And it's staggering. It, there was a study that was done by OECD. It was staggering how unhappy postdocs are because of the environment of, of the postdoc situation, both mentally, physically. They are doing postdoc, but they don't want to be doing postdoc. And if you look at it, those are supposed to be the engines of uh, future career ex expertise and, and, and researchers. This initiative, it's been a lot of work uh, collectively uh, between so far, between uh, HSRC, NRF, with support from Foundation Botner. We've, it was more of a co-creation uh, where HSRC led with NRF, but co-creation with Foundation Botner to look at ways in which we can have this initiative that looks at well-being of youth in the global south or in the developing region if you don't like that terminology global south and to kick start the the session basically the session will be very simple we'll have our leaders just to give us a bit of insights uh, uh, and welcoming remarks and later on we'll dive deep in terms of understanding what the project is all about and what we are trying to do at the end of the day. What are we trying to transform? What are we trying to change at the end of the day? And we've got expertise here, the leaders that will be walking us through the project in the next couple of years to walk us through the details. And of course, projects are supposed to be agile. Yes, there's timelines, there are milestones, but we need to engage as well, it's ask those teasing questions uh, that we might not understand. And that might even shape some of the programming going forward. Just now, I was browsing through again um, the vision and the pillars of Foundation Botner. And then I realized that without planning, it's so aligned to our leaders who are here from uh, both the NRF, Foundation Botner, and HSRC. Our CEO, uh, Dr. Fulufelo Nanomando, is an expert on AI or computation intelligence, whatever you call it. Yes, he's in the space of leading the National Research Foundation, but at the core, he is an expert. He's done lots of publications, supervised a lot. He's contributed a lot. If you look at Foundation Botner, one of their core pillars is AI. Prof. Uh, Lickness Simbini, who's shared a video, he's an expert who is a deputy CEO at the HSRC. He is an expert if you speak of public health, done a lot of research on on, on, on HIV and other, uh, and other areas linked to public health. If you look at Foundation Botna, one of the pillars in is on, on, on health. Uh, Annalyn Kozi Gatner, she's the Chief Director at Foundation, uh, Foundation Botna. She's so passionate about well being. So she speaks well being. She speaks how do we better society through well being? How do we better understand society and how do we improve society through well being? And then in the morning as well, we had a quick chat on PhD journey, how it can be so traumatic. And then there was a time she just had a light bulb moment just before she gave up on PhD. So excited to hear those stories. And on that note, uh, let me welcome to the front, a full fellow and uh, uh, Aline, just to sit here. Lickness will join via video. So we've got a video that will play uh, immediately after the two of you. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. And then we'll start with uh, uh, Fulu Fellow, who's our CEO, as I said, just to give us a bit of welcoming and a bit of motivation going forward as part of this initiative. Fulu. Are you good? You know, usually when you ask somebody whether they're good is when you ask the second question, which is, how good are you? Then you start hearing stories. So I'm hoping that you're all good, very good, and you don't have any, any secondary component. Uh, Mr. Program Director, uh, Dr. Ajigonta, uh, let me thank my partner in terms of this uh, uh, relationship. Dr. Aline Kosigatna, uh, 
Professor Lignes Simba, who's not here, but who's going to join via the technology. Uh, Prof. Jelin Schwartz, I saw, oh, yes. Um, let me also acknowledge the You Good thematic leads and the leadership of higher education and science councils in South Africa and in the region. Uh, good morning, colleagues, esteemed friends, ladies and gentlemen. The NRF is very much delighted to be launching the You Good Research Program that expands the reach of the NRF as a funder and intermediary organization in the developing world. We're equally delighted to be able to implement this program with a prominent partner, uh, Foundation Bodner, um, and engage with HSRC in seminal partnering model in the delivery of your good uh, program. One particular issue that everyone will know is the role of uh, the youth in society and the challenges that we face. In one of the panels yesterday, I indicated that when you look into uh, Africa as a continent, you realize that we have over 800 million people under the age of 20 on the continent, under the age of 20. According to the World Economic Forum, um, the indication is that by the year 2030, uh, we will have over 42% of the world's youth living on this continent. So youth becomes a focus that's by choice or by design, one has to actually work on. Young people have become the most vulnerable group to consider in the world today. If you look at the world in general and you look at the people who are displaced, uh, displaced in various parts, you look at people who are involved in the wars in Africa and other regions, um, is the youth or the younger population that's involved in carrying up uh, arms and fighting some of those wars. So we have a challenge uh, amongst ourselves to look into how do we then keep the youth very much engaged on things that make sense using science, ensuring that we can advance them. Because the very same youth that we have that might be an advantage could be a challenge if they are left unattended, if they are not meaningfully engaged in the society. Um, the very same youth that I'm talking about face unprecedented challenges in many aspects, and they continue to live towards a very uncertain and a precarious future. In this regard, it seems that the young population in the global south, I know you didn't like the term, but in the global south, are the most vulnerable ones. And therefore, it becomes a challenge to all of us to see what we can do. The young people are also leading in the developing of solutions to safeguard their futures and to safeguard the planet. I'm not going to spend time talking about this uh, um, uh, solution that they've de developed, but if you just walk or take a move around Africa and you see some of these solutions that are coming from a very young solution, uh, from a very young population, it's quite amazing that you have a population of youth that is willing to take steps to address challenges within the regions or within the countries within which they live. One particular issue that also comes in handy is the issue of AI, artificial intelligence, and the youth. Um, I mentioned again in another panel saying that when you look into artificial intelligence, with all these challenges, we know that it's here to stay for now. Uh, it might have winters that are coming, and I do predict one coming in the next few years. But again, it's a question of what do we do with the youth to ensure that they are meaningfully engaged the addressing issues of the data, um, the amount of data that we generate per day is amazing. But if you look at the sources of those data, it's usually the youth who are tweeting, who are you know, um, sending messages, uh, sharing sort of things, you know, Instagram pictures and so forth. So they are largest content producers. And it's a question of how do we then also engage them in analyzing that data and ensuring that we have an, a, a future that's informed by data and AI. Of course, there are many steps that need to be addressed in that particular space, one of which is to look into um, when you... 
So one of the, so now it's not too loud. Okay. So one of the things that we have to look into on the quality, on the data is issues of uh, data quality as well, to look into, you know, uh, how reliable is the data, data ownership, and so on. I'm not going to engage now on this component, but again, I believe that the youth population uh, is better placed to address some of those challenges. The Youth Good Research Program provides an opportunity to further strengthen youth-related research as an emergent area of investment for the NRF. It gives effect to our global commitment to support and enhance engage research in line with our science engagement efforts. You could provide a significant opportunity to contribute to the global knowledge base of youth related issues and effective interventions from global south perspective. The NRF has been deliberate to seek out and build long term partnerships with regional and international organizations as an important contributor to research and research capacity strengthening. Our engagement with Foundation Bodner further strengthens this resolve and provides a concrete example of a potential reach and impact within the developing world. Doing that while centering the youth as the cornerstone of the future of the world. We are thus very committed to harnessing uh, our world-class systems and processes for research and grants management, uh, the professional expertise, the skill base that we have, and the networks that we have to ensure that this program becomes a success. We must, and indeed we will, ensure that this program becomes extremely successful. So you can take that for me. We'll make sure that this program does not fail because it talks to the matters that are very close to us. You look into South Africa, crime rates that are very high, who are the people who are engaged in those crime activities is a young population. And we believe that we need to actually engage them fully to ensure that they are meaningfully contributing to society. The part ahead for this program will need to be informed by the fundamental principle uh, of meaningful participation, as I've indicated. It has to be underpinned by inclusion. It has to be underpinned by a strong commitment to producing cutting edge knowledge that, and I must emphasize, cutting edge means we cannot compromise on excellence. We have to ensure that excellence becomes a cornerstone. And that excellence that we're talking about should be able to then uh, progress the theory and the practice of relational well-being for the benefit of young people, but also of the society at large. So the NRF, in conclusion, is very committed to catalyzing this and ensuring that we work with our partner, uh, Foundation uh, Botner, to ensure that indeed the world becomes better. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Nelwamondo. I think your message is clear, the need for addressing issues around equity, equitability, and the youth, issues around AI and the youth that are so, so pertinent. And the youth, uh, they're, they're taking advantage of these partnerships that we have, leveraging the partners that we have, including Foundation Botna, as we address these emerging challenges uh, that are continuing, especially uh, being amplified within the youth, youth sector. And of course, at the core of it, we don't have to ex compromise excellency. I think that's what the core, that's one of the values of the National Research Foundation and HSRC and Foundation Botnet, all the partners that we'll be working with uh, in the Global South. And I'm also excited, this is not just about working with entities in Africa, but there are other partners in the Global South, 12 countries that will be participating in this initiative. That's very key if you look at how we can learn, share a bit of experiences and expertise and lessons across the regions and across the 12 countries that we'll be working in. So quite excited about that. <laughs> Dr. Guntner, uh, I would like just to invite you as well, just to speak of Foundation Bodner, as well as why this initiative and your passion on well-being. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. And let us enjoy because I'm so happy. This has been two years of work since the first idea came into, let's say, Fondation Borja to start this program. And now it's a celebration and achievement. And I'm even more excited that you as an uh, expert in AI and me as a physicist are going to celebrate social science. <laughs> So I think we will invite this cross-disciplinary, transdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach, everybody at the table who can advance the topic. And I think this is a good aura for this collaboration to start like this. So I'm very happy to announce this new collaboration, which I must say since two years and more than one year, we have been working together and already experienced the excellence of the work. So uh, for me, it's now an achievement, but it's a start, and we have a lot to do, but it always already started on an excellent, excellent level. So um, yeah, this is a groundbreaking research initiative called You Good. And as the Chief Development Officer of Fondation Bodna, I'm really excited to launch this new program that seeks to test and validate uh, the relational well-being framework um, from Professor Sarah White um, that we have endorsed at the foundation and which is a core principle of our programmatic work. So this means it helps us uh, to take a collaborative approach, to take young people's voice at the heart, and also to take a systemic lens uh, in the approach to our work. It's a great pleasure to see that through the special interest and the co-funding of NRF, we will work in South Africa as well as the 11 countries of focus from Fondation Botnar, which we, you will mention, uh, Charlene, in your presentation. So about Fondation Botnar, who we are. We are a Swiss philanthropy foundation who invest in idea and solution to improve and advance the well-being of young people worldwide, but on the focus on specific countries and leveraging the fast changing digital, let's say, space and the urban space where the majority of young people are living already and will live in the future. Research and knowledge is also a core pillar of our work and we found and connect research projects to explore new approach and ensure that solution we are creating are based on a solid foundation of evidence. So YouGood is an internationally and intentionally multi and transdisciplinary initiative bringing together from diverse fields to create a holistic understanding of relational well-being. By doing so, we aim to inform policies and practice for the betterment of our communities. Importance of young people participation, yes. It is central to our foundation approach. It's the active involvement of young people. Their perspective are critical in understanding the dynamic of relational well-being, and we are committed to ensuring that their experience, concerns, and hopes, and dreams are at the heart of our research process, and they are involved throughout these activities. Why relational well-being matters. The relational well-being framework provides a comprehensive lens through which we can explore the impact of relationship on individual and societal well-being. And our collaboration with the National Research Foundation and the Human Science Research Council show the importance of this undertaking by combining resource expertise and network we are well positioned to make a meaningful contribution to the field of relational well-being research. So I invite you to join us on this exciting journey of discovery and impact by applying and by joining the community of practice. Together, we can create new insight, drive positive change, and build a future where relational well-being is a priority in society 
will inform policy and practice. Thank you so much for hosting me at this session and inviting me today. And let's go on together on this journey together. Thank you much. We're excited to have you here and flying all the way just for this session. Flying yesterday, leaving tomorrow, especially for this session. We appreciate your dedication, your leadership, and just showing how you value this, uh, this, this initiative. And of course, uh, we are looking forward to walking the journey with you. I believe this is one of the many journeys, many projects that we'll be doing going in the future and excited to be here yeah, working with you. I will now uh, ask my colleagues to play a video by our uh, deputy CEO for HSRC, <laughs> Professor Lignes Simbai, Simbai, who is unable to join us today, but sent a recorded video. Please. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to you during the launch of this important program. The HSRC's main mandate is to promote and undertake human sciences research to understand social conditions and the process of social change. Our research contributes to policies and programs that support South Africa's development objectives such as alleviating poverty, reducing inequality, and stimulating innovations for employment creation. We at the HSRC are committed to cutting edge research that supports development nationally in the Southern African Development Community, or SADC, and in Africa. Our work in the HSRC involves multiple stakeholders, which include government and state bodies, academic institutions, science councils, corporate entities, civil society funders, and the broader South African public. We also aim to solidify our global relevance through linking to frameworks such as the South African government's National Development Plan pillars and the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. Against this background, the You Good program will extend the work that we do as the HSRC by creating meaningful partnerships with global experts and young people who are invested in the well-being of the global south. In particular, this partnership will contribute explicitly to the achievement of all five of our strategic indicators. To start with our first strategic indicator on national, regional, and global leadership in the production and use of targeted knowledge to support the eradication of poverty, the reduction of inequalities, and the promotion of employment. As the research program aims to identify what contributes to continued levels of inequality in material and well, mental well-being that is linked to poor access to human rights. Secondly, uh, the study contributes to a second strategic indicator which aims to establish a consolidated relationship of trust and influence with government to help guide and inform policy as the research will produce empirical evidence on the link between climate change, digitalization, livelihoods, and mental health, and the experiences of well-being of young people in the global south. Thirdly, in terms of our third strategic indicator, which is on recognition as a trusted engaged research partner with scientific communities and civil society, the research program actions collaborative research projects with other science councils. Fourthly, the program contributes to uh, a fourth indicator, 
which, which is transformed research capabilities in the number of masters and PhD trainees through its community of practice and project conferences and training for emerging scholars. Finally, the program contributes to our fifth indicator on sustainable income streams uh, as the program of work is a large international grant totaling over 5 million rand. In terms of the partnership and uh, social impact, in sum, UGood aims to improve the well-being of young people, particularly within the Global South. And the HSRC is excited to embark on this work as it links to our mandate, identified national priorities, opening clear opportunities for societal impact and aligns with the organization's recognition of the importance of collaborations with organizations to achieve national and global objectives. I thank you and best wishes during the rest of the session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Mbai. And I saw he was in Cape Town. Did you see that background? <laughs> I thought I was the only one, but exciting to be working with HSRC. There's a lot of expertise and just bringing them on board to shape and lead this initiative, not just for South Africa, but some of the, the lessons, how they will be spread within the region and the other participating, uh, participating countries. So excited to note the leadership from HSRC and the buy-in that they are providing with this, uh, with this initiative. On that note, we're now getting into the gist of things now. We need to unpack why you good? What is you good? What are we trying to develop? What are we trying to build? What are we trying to, uh, to transform at the end of the day? We've got a very exciting panel for, for, for you today. Very diversified as well. Uh, different regions, just to help us unpack the different uh, elements of you good with that well-being uh, component of it. Firstly, I would like to uh, introduce our lead expert, Prof, uh, Prof. Shalene Swaz, who is a division executive at HSRC on equitable education and economics research. That's very packed, but it speaks equitability, education, and economics. She's a renowned expert in the world, and we're excited to be having her here as a lead in the project. Second, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Roshni Negahali from India. Uh, she's the executive director of a nonprofit Youth for Unity Voluntary Action, Yuva, in India. She's mostly focused, her role is focused on enabling rights for marginalized groups. Uh, in India and around the world. We're also excited to be having her joining via video. Last but not least, we've got uh, Mariano, Prof. Mariano Rogers, who's a professor of economics at the, uh, uh, a country that's in, in a bit in Mexico, but she's, she's at Ohio University, State University, but we're excited to be having her here as well. She works a lot with the subjects of well-being, uh, uh, quality of life, as well as other components linked to progression of well-being, especially within, within the youth. We're also excited to be having her join here as part of, of the conversation. To kickstart, uh, Prof. Shares, uh, I'll invite you just to un unpack a lot of the details of the program and uh, expectations. Uh, excited to have you here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll flip that on. Good morning, esteemed colleagues, and all protocol observed. Really fantastic to be with you. And am I also supposed to say, you good? Yeah. <laughs> so colleagues, I want you to think back to when you were 15. I want you to think back to when that was. Was it the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s? I think I'll stop there. <laughs> what was your life like? Just think about it for a second. Because this program of work says that young people in the global south has got something to offer the world. 
On Monday and Tuesday, I was in Kigali, and the topic for conversation was, what are we going to do about the future of work for young people on our beautiful continent? On Wednesday and Thursday, I was back in Cape Town and hosting the second Lancet Commission on Adolescent Health and Wellbeing. And that question was, what are the mega trends that are coming um, and that are almost already here? And two of those big trends are that most of the world's young people are going to be in two places, in Africa and in South Asia. What are those young people going to contribute to the world? So young people in the global south, um, who's, <laughs> my, my um, remote is on her cell phone, <laughs> which is great, right? That's what young people are doing. But young people in the global south, for me, is a really important uh, description. And even if you don't like it, let me tell you why you should like it. To be in the global south, to be part of the global south, means that you have been colonized in the past, your history. It means that you have been excluded from knowledge flows. And it means that you have been excluded from global tra trade and access to economics, to money. So I'm hoping that some of you are here because you want one of these research grants, because the money that we have is exciting. I spent 12 years as a youth worker in a small NGO um, in Johannesburg that works through the continent. And the big question was, where's the money for improving our programs and our research? I've spent 16 years as a sociologist of youth. And the big question was, where is the investment in youth research? Colleagues, this week, from the Foundation Botna, the investment in this project is enormous, and it's almost like young people's time have come. Last, the last few days, the investment in the Lancet Commission, the investment in the Youth and the Future of Work, it means that when we think about 90% of the world's young people are in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, for the first time, I can say in decades, we can say that the investment in the research around their work and their worlds um, is actually keeping, uh, uh, keeping track with who they are in the world. There are unprecedented challenges to their future, a threat to their very being. But remember what I asked you, what was your adolescence like? Tell me that it wasn't filled with wonder and friends and newness and excitement and that your parents protected you from the coming climate change and the uh, oppression that was happening in this country. Don't tell me that your, your adolescence was actually quite magical. So it's not only doom and gloom that they will be, they are, we have problems with livelihoods, with technological rupture, with the climate crisis, with health, with mental health, with economic turbulence, with war, with political instability. Um, it's not only that, it's also energy and resources that young people bring. Surely, or was your adolescence any different? And so young people in the global north and south face some of the same issues, but young people in the global south often have fewer resources and buffers in order to address those issues. What do we mean by well-being? Well, I could give, I think, I was thinking about it in the shuttle, I think I could give six weeks of lectures of well -being, on well-being, but I'm going to do it in 35 seconds. Well-being rather than health is about being positive, aspirational, and inclusive. It's about talking about the whole of us, our mind, our body, and our spirit, and connecting those, because we are. We are people in this continent of faith or none, of body and physicality and sport and beauty, um, and we're also people of the mind. Um, and so those are all really important in talking about well-being. And it's a pushback against just the negative characterization of life, which is what we sometimes get into when we talk about the health of young people or young people as a problem. But there are many different kinds of well-being. And so this is where I could go into a long lecture. But an absence of pain, the, pleasure, uh, the presence of pleasure, meaning in life, material well-being, what you have, assets, welfare, and that's the piece that we often talk about in research. Subjective well-being, how do you feel about what it is that you have? The values, the ideologies, and the agencies. Some people have started to speak about the multidimensional nature of well-being, which is quite obvious, but actually it's something that we've got to put in the forefront of our minds when we think about young people and, 
and relational well-being. People have started to talk about collective well-being. You're not well on your own. In fact, often you're quite lonely and excluded and marginalized and alienated. But together, remember back to your adolescence? When were you the happiest? I hope it was playing cricket in the street, right? Dusty street of wherever you were. I hope it was when your mom called you and it, you were saying, just another 10 minutes. Because the collective nature of youth is something that we must capitalize on, that we must help them to bring to bear to solve the problems, the intractable problems of our times. And so relational well-being builds on all of these different definitions of well-being, but it says, what do you have through others in social, collective, and structural dimensions, and how can all of those resources be brought to bear on solving problems and creating an environment in which you can thrive? And so that's what you good is about, a focus on relational well-being. Well-being is inherently relational. Our, our little side strap says why well-being is relational or youth well-being is relational. Maybe adult well-being is also relational if we let it have a chance. Well-being is co-constructed in relationships between people, but also between people and the environment. We can't be well if there's oppression and inequality and war and genocide. We can't be well if, as um, somebody said this morning, the planet is showing us flames. But we can be well through our beliefs, our cultures, our traditions, and our religions. And tell me that research frequently doesn't focus on those things because we're driven by a global north agenda um, who, who believe themselves to be post-culture, post-religion, post-secular. Um, but what about the structures, policies, and politics of our continent, especially of the global south in particular? But how do we measure, isolate, study, and test all of these things? It's going to be really hard. And I'm really excited to be here, to be the lead, but I'm a specialist in the sociology of youth. And I'm, I love young people, and I want to see them thrive, but I'm also going to grow and learn about what relational well-being means. And I'm hoping that you and many of my colleagues will join me in that. And the use of relational well-being in the literature, apart from the work of Professor Sarah White that Eileen has mentioned, is really on, a, on social relationships and romantic relationships and familial relationships and work relationships. But we really need a better definition. We need ways of testing, understanding, implementing, growing, supporting this notion of relational well-being. And we're hoping that that's what you good is going to do over the next five years. It's more than collective well-being. We want to try to, at the end of this research program, uh, have in the literature a lot more work on a southern approach to relational well-being. Um, how does relational well-being work? It often works when societies are not well-functioning, or orderly or regulated, and how can we make it work in those contexts? What about where there's not strong social bonds and there's not an excuse me, excuse me saying this, an old boys club to help you get ahead. How do young people create their own new relational networks? Is there another way? And that's what we believe in New Good, that we have opportunities to draw on the South's collective and cultural resources and practices, not just Ubuntu, but including Ubuntu. Other ways of young people galvanizing their efforts to overthrow a government, to overthrow an unjust system, young people galvanizing efforts to meet together to pass their matric exams. Um, all of those things are things that we want to galvanize and work towards. And it's often ignored in the research. So what do we envisage with this program of research? Professor Zimbai spoke about a small figure of money. Actually, it's much bigger than that. <laughs> um, he meant dollars, but even then it's twice what he, what he mentioned. We're thinking that relational well-being will be a holistic approach to research. Not just are we going to research relational well-being, we want to act in a relational way. I was going to ask you to turn to your neighbor and talk about your adolescent experience, but then I realized that we're going to go over time and this is a very august, austere academic gathering. But you know what I mean. We can work relationally or we can work in silos and then we can work egotistically. And we hope that you good is not going to be that. And if it is, call us out because we want this to be relational in how we invite people to join, who we promote in terms of young scholars um, developing their work. So relational thinking must be part of this program of work. Relational data gathering, not extractive, 
because that's often what is done in the global north. We want to be different in relational working. Our methodologies, our epistemology, our ontology, for those of you who need to know those words today. The You Good program of research aims to strengthen the theory and the concepts around relational well-being. Aline has spoken about that. But we also want to get networks of scholars together to create meaningful impact in young people's lives. And we want young people to participate, not in a token way, not by sitting at the kiddie table, but by bringing them to the adult table at Christmas lunch. We want to test and develop relational approaches. We want to generate empirical insights. And we want to offer to the world these insights, something that comes from the global south that has a chance um, to really make a difference in people's lives. So we're putting out a call for research proposals. In the next uh, month and January, we're going to get some matchmaking happening because we want people to work together. Um, the 12 uh, uh, focus countries are Colombia, Ecuador, Egypt, Ghana, India, Indonesia, Morocco, Senegal, South Africa, Tanzania, and Vietnam, and Romania, because, because they've been excluded. Many young people in Romania have been excluded. They may be ostensibly part of the global north, but they've been excluded from global flows of trade and knowledge. Around 23-year projects will be funded. Um, we've got over $10 million in funding from the Foundation Botna and co-funding from the NRF. Um, and we're going to address these four thematic areas. And so what we really want to do is we want a community of practice. So here's the thing that's a little bit different. Some of you may be used to getting a research grant, going off into the distance and coming back in five years and saying, I've done it. And here's my financial statements and my paper or book. No, 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 no. This program of work is going to say, as we learn, let's talk to each other and let's grow together across these next five years and beyond, perhaps. So a community of practice that will bring together young people, academics, other stakeholders, program partners, partners, funders, to talk regularly. We're going to conference. We're going to Zoom. We're going to WhatsApp. We might even TikTok. <laughs> to what ends? We really believe that you good can deepen theory from the global south around young people and relational well-being. We want to foreground southern ways of knowing, and we want to center youth voices, not as a token, but as material to this research enterprise. So what I've asked four of my colleagues uh, to do is what kind of proposals might we like to see? Now, three of them are here. One is uh, sitting in Basel. She handed in her PhD last Monday and is waiting for the defense. But we asked four colleagues who are going to be thematic leads on digitalization, uh, Chris Chetty, um, Cindy Lee McBride on climate change, Candace, Dr. Candice Grunewald on, on mental health, and, and Dr. Angelique Bilskut on livelihoods or employment. You know, what kind of pro projects might we like to see? Now, I asked them to do it in two minutes. Now, there might be a hundred different topics, but why don't you take a look at this video um, and see, you know, what they have to say. You can rethink about your adolescence again. <laughs> Maybe 20 projects that we can fund over... Th so we're envisaging a call for research proposals. We've got maybe... 20 projects that we can fund over three years. We're very excited about the partnership with Foundation Botna and the NRF to make this happen, to make it a reality, to try to do some of the research for young people in the Global South with, the, with them and in a community of practice. And so I'm joined by our four thematic leads today, and I've asked them just one question. What kind of research proposals would they be really excited to see coming through this call in each of their areas of specialization? And I'm going to start with Krish. Uh, Krish, in terms of digitalization and digital inclusion, what kinds of research proposals would you be delighted to see? Yes, thanks, Jolene. Well, the big question in the digitalization space relates to how advancing technology influences a young person's relationships, 
and their collective well-being here in the global south. Um, if we just look at the digital inclusion problem, the question is how does your exclusion affect your ability to build networks and social capital? And here across the African continent, our research has found that there are strong cultural biases that deny a young female student access to technology. So we can examine this using relational thinking. And we do this by analyzing the networks that influence her access to technology. So this reveals crucial community relational dynamics that contribute to this bias. Great, thank you, Krish. Um, Cindy Lee, when it comes to climate change and the climate crisis, what kind of research proposals would you be delighted to see? Uh, thanks, Charlene. So, for example, considering the limited research on how youth with disabilities are especially vulnerable to extreme weather events, projects that use participatory methods, um, so including young people, including youth organizations, um, and they call attention to the physical or social dynamics of how climate change affects their daily lives and future prospects would be really interesting. Or in contexts where rising temperatures impact learners who attend schools with tin roofing, research projects that investigate how those learners, their teachers, their parents collectively respond to these challenges would also be really interesting. Um, some methodologies for the study could include perhaps a podcast series that documents the different actions that are taken by the parties involved. And then the third example could be inviting young people from adolescent care centers in different contexts to participate in a series of social network interviews. So this is an innovative Global South research methodology that involves interviews conducted by research participants with methods of their own community and their own networks. And it can really help the participants to develop and strengthen climate action networks. Great, thank you, Cindy Lee. Uh, Candice, in terms of mental health and young people and relational well-being, what kind of proposals would you like to see? Thanks, Charlene. Our hope is to receive proposals that are going to address the big issues around mental health. And a particular issue that we've observed over the last couple of years is an increase in suicide attempts amongst young people. So if a researcher, for example, wanted to develop an intervention and wanted to do that in an innovative way, let's say through a chatbot, um, our questioning there would be if you apply that the relational well-being framework to this particular development of the chatbot, we would expect you to do three things. The first thing is you must think about how mental health, how suicide and other concepts that you might be thinking of are understood within that community. What are the risk factors and what are the factors that would promote mental health? Number two, how young people can be meaningfully involved in the development of that particular chatbot. Not just about the content, but the look and feel. It has to be contextually relevant. And then number three, how can you work with stakeholders, other individuals or other organizations that are invested in the mental health um, um, outcomes of young people? And the intention there is to build partnerships and thinking about creating a collective urgency around the work that we are doing. So this relational well-being framework is very valuable because it allows us to think about mental health concerns and that it does not exist in silos and, and the solutions to mental health also does not exist in silos but that we have to think about it, about it in a multifaceted way um, in order for us to promote mental health amongst young people in the global south. Wow that's fascinating thank you Candice thank and you. Angelique when it comes to young people work employment livelihoods what kind of proposals would you love to see? Well, Charlie, when you talk about understanding how young people navigate livelihood in the global south it's very important to recognize that most don't do it alone. They do so in the company of close and extended family and friends and elders and other community members. And these relations are crucial for their well-being. The Latin American context, for example, alerts us to the reality that many young people are actually navigating livelihoods in the company of drug cartels and gangs. It is also common to see young people navigating livelihood within broken family support and structures and networks. In India, there are also examples of livelihoods interventions that have not resulted in valued outcomes 
for the young people involved because of the role of the caste system, for example, with some youth actually being stigmatized due to their involvement. So these examples point to the importance of incorporating a relational perspective. Relational well-being, we feel, allows us to focus on these varied contexts within which young people navigate livelihoods with insecurity, territorial inequality, social status, and labor market precarity that frame the potential for the well-being of young people in Global South context. Thank you, Angelique. That was really uh, well put. And thank you to all four of our thematic leads, just for providing some insight into what these research proposals might look like. We're very excited to be taking this forward, and we really welcome critique and, and comment on how to take it forward in the most exciting and youth relevant way. These voices of young people from the Global South, from researchers, are all going to be an important part of what we do to deepen our theoretical knowledge, but also the interventions that we offer to young people going forward. Thank you so much, colleagues. I couldn't have put it better myself. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Prof. You can see the passion, isn't it? So we've started something big and hopefully we build on that passion. And of course, there's expectation. That means there's a lot of expectation as well from us as uh, leaders from HSRCs, uh, NRF, and our other partners to make sure that we deliver and the issues around co-creation. This is not just a top-down approach. How do we work with the individuals, with the community, with the youth to both co-create, design, monitor, as well as perform uh, these projects that, uh, that we, are, we are proposing? And I like the community of practice as well, because it brings in the different stakeholders, not just about research and the youth, but how do we bring in government, private sector to be part of this conversation. Thank you a lot. And uh, I know we are running a bit uh, uh, over time, but now I would like to call upon our next speaker. Let me just get my notes straight. Yes, Prof. Uh, Rashni. Nagahari, uh, if, if you are there, she'll be joining online and she'll share a bit of experiences with youth, youth activism, as well as just engage within the context of. Okay, I think the next one will be Prof. Mariana Rogers. Apologies if you can wait. Uh, are you there? Excellent. Uh, so we're looking forward as well to your engagement, just to walk us through your experiences and some of the works that you've done linked to what we're trying to do within the You Good uh, uh, initiative. Excited to have you here and we are listening in. Thank you. Hello, thank you very much for being here. I'm looking for the presentation, it's right here. So can you see? Uh, I understand you can see the presentation and um, you can. Yes, we can. Okay. okay, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you to the National Research Foundation. And um, I would like to talk about well being and the, the, the role of relationships. We have done a lot of research in Latin America mostly, but also in, in the, what we call the Western world in the United States. And what we find is that relations matter, that they are very important uh, for people's well-being. And then I would like to, to share with you some of this research, but not focusing on the, on the empirical part, but on the inside. What are the main ideas behind uh, this uh, role of relations, relational well-being, and people's well-being? No? Well, the, the first thing that I would like to say is that uh, Following this bottom-up approach, uh, we go to people and we ask people about their well-being. Uh, a question as uh, simple as, are you good? Are you good? Uh, people can answer that. They can say, yeah, uh, I'm very happy with my life. I'm satisfied with the life I have. Um, they usually say, 
uh, I'm experiencing enjoyment in life, or they may say I'm sad, depressed, anxiety, I have a lot of problems. So people can express their situation. And I think it's important to ask people, uh, how are you? you know, or are you good? How satisfied are you with your life? And going deeper into different kinds of experiences that human beings have. And you will see a lot of faces in this presentation because human well-being is about people, about concrete human beings, about uh, little kids, about young people, elders, uh, about human beings, because human beings have this capacity of experiencing well-being. They know when they are well, and they know when they are not doing good. And uh, what we can do is to ask them, and then to, to explore, to do research on what determines, what impacts on these people's satisfaction with life. Why are they doing, doing good? Why they say, I'm satisfied with my life? We can go and ask kids, we can go and ask elders, adults, and what we should really find is that there are many, many factors uh, 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 intervening in people's satisfaction with life, in how they assess their life, but a crucial factor that shows up everywhere in the world is interpersonal relationships, uh, how they relate to us. And we study these relationships and we find out that there is not any kind of relationship that matters. There are many relationships that are basically functional relationships, relationships where you approach others in order to get something. Those relationships are not very gratifying. They do not contribute a lot to people's well-being. But there are other relationships that are really important for people's well-being. And that's what we call person-based, person-to-person, recognizing that people are in relationships, that we grow up in relationships, that we go through life in relationships with others. And how we approach them and how they approach us matters a lot. If we feel we are instrumentalized, if we feel we are used by others to attain their own objectives, those relationships do not contribute to people's well-being. They may contribute to production, they may contribute to competitiveness, uh, to exports and imports in the world, but not to people's well-being. What we need are relationships where people approach each other as persons in a holistic way, knowing the other person, taking time to chat, to talk with the other person, and to know his or her life trajectory uh, and that creates a non-instrumental, non-commodifying, uh, warm relationship. Those relationships are the important ones for well-being. Uh, there are many relational spheres or realms of life where people can have and experience these person-based interpersonal relationships. Here you have like a picture of uh, a typical Latin American family. Uh, even neighbors are included. You, know? you have aunt, grandpa, grandma, but you have friends. You have a community here. Uh, it's an extended community where people know each other. They've known each other for, for years, decades. Uh, they grow up together. They share life together. And that creates this kind of warm relationships that contribute to well-being. So when we go and do research on are you good, are you satisfied with life, we find out that in Latin America, a lot of people are satisfied with life. And it is not because they have a lot of purchasing power, a lot of income. It is not because the condition uh, infrastructure uh, is very good. No, it is because they have one close person-to-person -person relationships. They feel they are treated as persons 
and that contributes to their well-being uh, rather than treated as a, a tool, an instrument, a, a worker, an employee. No, they are persons. Even in their jobs, they are treated as persons. They know the history behind that face, and that's important to create warm relationships that contribute to well-being. You, you can try to pursue relationships that are mostly instrumental, and those are productive. Uh, and I say you can increase productivity just by extenuating your work, but you will not produce well-being in those conditions. So why relationships matter? There are many reasons. Uh, from an evolutionary perspective, as a human space, we, we grew up and we, we grew up in a community. We cannot grow up alone. No? We need a family, an extended family. We need a village. We need a community to survive, but also to enjoy the life uh, we have. There is also this idea that we go through life interacting with others in an intergenerational uh, interaction with our grandparents, aunts, uncles, uh, that's attachment theory. The identity you have, who you are, depends on where do you grow up, whom you grow up with, and that's the role of nurturing, attachment, being with others, having friends that shape your identity and you shape theirs also. Human beings have necessities, and we have focused a lot on physiological necessities. Usually, when you think about necessities or human needs, uh, people think about hunger and they think about housing. But we have done some research on this topic, and the most important needs, the, the most uh, human needs that contribute to, to well-being are the satisfaction of the love and belonging needs. If you have this sense of belonging to a group, a larger community, your family, your friends, your neighborhood, your extended family, uh, if you have that need satisfied, your well-being increases a lot. Uh, so love and belonging needs are more important than physiological needs and even more important than safety needs in the contribution to well-being. Uh, to be sincere, we, we need a place that we can call home. Home not in the sense of a house, home in the sense of a place where we come and everybody knows us and they treat us as persons. And that's what we call unconditional acceptance, something you get in the community. You are accepted not, not because you are rich, not because you are productive, not because you can contribute to external goals, but you are accepted because they love you, they care about you, and you belong to that community. So, when we talk about relationships, sometimes we we just focus on support. And we say, well, maybe you, you can have somebody uh, that supports you, that helps you. But that's not so important. What is really important is to have a group of people that join you in the journey of life, that go with you to this journey in life, that you can call friends, that you can call uh, uh, cousins, uncles, that you can call, these are my partners in this journey of life. That satisfies your needs of love and belonging, uh, creates attachment, identity. You have a place you can call home uh, because you have a group of people that go with you through the journey of life. And this goes beyond this individualistic perspective um, that is very stressed 
uh, in uh, Western societies, uh, the individual no, that can survive alone, that can go through life alone with a credit card, purchasing commodities and obtaining well-being. That's not uh, what we find out in research. It's not your credit card, it's the people who accompany you in the journey of life. No? So uh, we need to do more research on well-being, uh, and we need to do it, uh, I would say, in the Global South. Why? Because the Global South has this uh, relational work. Um, we, we still have extended families. We have a sense of family values, and we are not individualistic and materialistic-oriented society. Research in the Western uh, world emphasizes economic well-being because they, they are more focused on your credit card and your purchasing power. But uh, we recognize in the Global South, and especially in Latin America, which is my area of research, that uh, the relational fabric is a very important source of life satisfaction and well-being. And then we have to, to do research because if we do not do research in the Global South, we cannot expect this research to come from the North and it will not fit the conditions of the Global South. Uh, we see that there are problems in the Global South with the deterioration of relationships. Um, I'm not very optimistic about what is happening because the influence of materialistic values, uh, consumerism, uh, individualism, uh, a, a faster pace of life, people don't have time to relate because they have to work, they have to commute, uh, they migrate and they are destroying uh, family bonds. So there are a lot of problems emerging that need our attention and need to focus on this world uh, in the global south that contributes to people's well-being and that uh, uh, relationships. I, I usually mention education because I think we are educating people to be productive, to get into the labor market, to be competitive, and we are not educating people to relate with others. Uh, schools are not emphasizing relationships. Schools are places to go and learn to be productive, and that's not what we should emphasize because we are forgetting other areas. I'm just finishing. Um, we need more research because there are manifestations of problems uh, emerging in the global south, uh, loneliness, drug abuse, suicide, intuition. And just to finish, well, we need to think about development strategies that are not only focused on the economy, but most importantly on the well-being of people, and this includes the relationships they have. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Uh, Rogers, as well as to remind us that the issues that we are dealing with are global issues. It's not about the region Africa. It's similar kind of uh, challenges within uh, the Americas and globally. So we're excited to hear of the works that you're doing and then the intensity as well the focused approach in terms of where we are going as part of this initiative. And excellent to note that you're part of uh, this gathering and this project going in the future. Just a sincere apologies. We are running out of time. So the video that we had uh, prepared for uh, uh, Professor uh, Rashni won't be played now. But what we'll do is, through our communications, we'll put it somewhere online, and then you can watch the videos. It's very insightful, especially if you speak of youth activism, which is part of this cohort of communicating uh, the challenges that, that, that we have. So that video will be shared with the audience, both here and, and online, for you to watch. Uh, now I'd like to introduce and welcome one of our very good colleagues, Dandiwe Matthews. 
She's uh, a lecturer at the University of Witwatersrand. Besides that, she's been uh, an attorney. So it's good that we bring her on board just to look at the other dynamics on what the discussion here is on well-being, broadly responding to the issues. But if you speak with the heart of an attorney as a judge, what can you tell us? Thank you a lot. and looking forward to your interventions as well. Thanks. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you for having me, um, and thank you for that lovely introduction, Sipo. So I was asked to speak to two issues. The first was regarding the importance of this program to capacitate um, young people, um, and also to respond to their needs with respect to the challenges that they face within our society today. So as mentioned earlier by Prof Schwartz, with respect to this program strengthening the capacity of young people in the global south, I think the UGUD program is a much needed intervention, and I will limit my views to the perspective as being an African and particularly black South African woman um, in 2023. So Africa is a youthful continent where the majority of our people are under the age of 30. At the same time, we continue to live in an ageist society where young people are excluded politically and socially from participating in decision-making processes that directly affect them. While youth unemployment rates soar and environmental degradation persists in the name of sustaining a free market economy that excludes a significant proportion of them, throughout the world, young people struggle to secure lived wa livable waged work as a mechanism to access social inclusion and basic human rights entitlements as globalized economies become more vulnerable to exploitation and the disruptive effects of climate change intensify. We are dealing with a world that is both more unequal and more connected than it, than it has ever been before. In the South African context, the post-1994 democratic dispensation has manufactured a bifurcated society where black youth remain the most disenfranchised politically, economically, and socially, where the intersection of race and gender still determines one's income and wealth and subsequent social security, where gender-based violence is normalized, where Afrophobia is entrenched as necessary for survival, and where the provision of basic services as socioeconomic rights entitlements has done little to alleviate the pervasive systems of intergenerational poverty and inequality that particularly young black people confront daily. Instead, racialized poverty has deepened while structural inequality is reinforced. Whereas many countries grapple with the implications of excessive wealth held by the elite top 1% of its population, in South Africa, it is the top 10% that receive more than 65% of the country's national income, while the bottom 50% of the population earn just 5.3% of that total. The racialized dimension of inequality in the country has also seen white South Africans improving their economic status post-1994 in South Africa, while a disproportionate number of black South Africans and predominantly young black women remain poor. So research along the themes identified in the UGUD program, namely livelihoods, mental health, digitalization, and climate change, speak to the systemic challenges that confront particularly young people of the global South. Interdisciplinary and empirical research that aims to address these challenges in diverse settings across the global South will not only bring the opportunity for South-South collaboration, but also to develop innovative solutions to complex social problems centering the, the experiences of young people to prosper in the future. Secondly, with respect to how the well-being approach can contribute toward active citizenship on our continent, as explained earlier, relational well-being posits that well-being is inherently relational, co-constructed in relationships between people, with the environment through beliefs, cultures, traditions, religions, societal structures, and the policy and support landscape. Indeed, this definition of relational well-being corresponds with the African value of Ubuntu. And broadly defined, Ubuntu refers to communal relationality as the essence of humanness, where the individual forms an integral part of society predicated on compassionate and recipro reciprocal social relations. The concept of relational well-being 
further corresponds with South Africa's constitutional aims to advance a society embedded with the values of dignity, equality, and social justice. So from the fees must fall movement in South Africa to the Arab Spring, Arab Spring in North Africa, environmental justice movements in Latin America, and feminist movements in Southeast Asia, young people frequently de demonstrate their active citizenship and commitment to the advancement of democracy. They rely on innovative measures, largely through online digital platforms, to overcome the barriers that prevent traditional ways of organizing. For example, in 2020, young people reportedly mobilized on TikTok to boycott a Trump event hosted in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where they created the impression that the event was sold out, but was actually empty when he arrived. Importantly, this was a global campaign with young people all over the world, using their agency to mobilize action, but also demonstrated on their terms their dissatisfaction with the influence of his leadership on the global world order. However, when young people exert their claims, they are often met with resistance and state repression. This not only causes mental anguish and anxiety, but all too often marginalizes young people socially, politically, and economically from pursuing prosperous lives to which they are entitled. So centering the well-being approach in research concerning contemporary challenges confronting youth of the global south is therefore essential to ensuring that programs and policies in response to these challenges adequately cater to the complexity of their collective needs. Thank you so much, Dr. Seppel. Thank you so much, uh, Tandiwe. And I don't know, maybe it was just me, but if Ms. Matthew speaks, you can tell she means business. <laughs> you have to do good. Social justice has to be done and we have to act. The research has to make an impact. Skills development programs have to make an impact. All of us have to uh, contribute towards making this project work. Thank you so much for your insightful uh, comments. And we are looking forward as well to working with you to be part of this conversation and just to bring us to order if things don't work well. Thanks a lot and uh, much appreciated. Another apology, sorry, there's a bit of apologies because this conversation is too exciting. The time cannot just do justice. 90 minutes is not always enough. We're gonna skip the, the, the component on questions, but the conversation has just started. Yes, you can, it's just started. So let's engage uh, via different platforms. We have 10 minutes to go. There's other sessions that are happening uh, across the road at the Science Forum and colleagues need to, to move there. But for me, this is an opportunity to start the conversation, not just within this podium, but to look at other means that we can start the conversation. Use social media. I'm sure, Tandy, there's already a hashtag, you good. Uh, let's create that, please. There's email address that will be shared. Let's start talking. I think even the discussion, the question that we want to pose, a bigger community need to hear them beyond this community. So apologies for that. People were itching to find out questions, and the leaders are here, so I think they can take the lead in terms of continuing the conversation outside uh, outside this uh, this venue. Would like as well, before I call on, upon our senior colleague, to thank all the project leaders who will be leading. Some of them, uh, you've heard uh, their voices uh, in terms of what they'll be doing. Thank you so much for taking lead in this so much exceptional uh, program, but we're looking forward as well to engage become much more uh, inclusive within the different spheres. We need more champions. They are leaders, of course, but we need more leaders as we go forward. So building those champions, uh, linking those champions to work at a global stage within these different communities and, 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 and countries. So we're excited for that and looking forward to working with you. In closing, I would like to call upon our senior as a deputy C, acting deputy CEO for research, innovation, impact advancement, uh, Dr. Gugu Muche. She is a mathematician. We are adding a layer: physics, AI, sociology. Some of us are everywhere. Looking forward to hearing from you, Gugu. Thank you. Colleagues, good morning. Mine is brief, uh, it's just to provide closing remarks. Uh, up to this point, colleagues, we have heard about how the NRF Foundation Botner 
an HSRC uh, think why is this program necessary? We have heard from our researchers uh, what research questions will be pursued and what themes will be focused on. We have heard about what types of proposals will be envisaged. And in terms of the NRF in particular, we have heard about how this program will leverage NRF's strong linkages nationally, regionally, and globally that have led to the successful implementation of various multilateral funding instruments in the past. Question then remains, what's next? As of today, the You Good Research Program has opened the space for researchers to engage with each other through the Our Space platform of Foundation Botner, which can be accessed through You Good website that you use to RSVP for this launch. This is a space that is intended uh, to connect researchers who are interested in working in the 12 countries of focus and who are working in the thematic areas that we have heard about. To the NRF will launch uh, the call for expressions of interest on the 22nd of January, 2024, followed by a capacity strengthening of those that will be shortlisted to submit full proposals. And then the submissions of full proposals will happen during the second quarter of 2024. At this point, colleagues, allow me to thank Foundation Botner and the HSRC for joining hands with the NRF to implement this program. And also would like uh, to leave you with uh, what we and the NRF see as a call to action to join the You Good uh, movement and to publicize You Good within your research community so we can increase research and visibility of this program. Thank you all for celebrating this lunch with us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you a lot, uh, Dr. Muche. Your leadership is always appreciated. In closing, this initiative would have been where it is now without the hardworking teams from HSRC, NRF, and other colleagues. In particular, I'll just highlight a few colleagues, but it's a lot, there's a team behind it. From the NRF, of course, uh, Dr. Dorothy Ngira and Dr. Prudence Makura, thank you a lot for your, for your leadership. Appreciate it and looking forward to your drive as we go forward. From the HSRC as well, Prof. Schwarz, thanks a lot for your team, your leadership, your insights as we drive this initiative. And as well from other partners, other colleagues who's been in the background pushing at the agenda that we are, uh, we are here gathering for. And we are looking forward to making you good, feel good, and being real good. Besides that, I'm adding lots of terminologies to it. Besides that, just to thank our leadership as well, our CEO, Dr. Fulufelo Nenomondo, just for giving us a space to do amazing innovative projects within this space of uh, uh, well-being well and uh, the project You Good. Dr. Gantner, thanks a lot for traveling all the way just to meet us. It's beyond, I think, uh, just speaking on virtual. Meeting uh, the people is always uh, uh, a value add. And we look forward to you visiting us even more in the future as we incorporate uh, you good within our programming and implement. So looking forward to the wines that we spoke of earlier on. I think this is the time. <laughs> And to other colleagues as well, I see Dr. Aldo Throber here. He was very, very instrumental in shaping and guiding the You Good as we were developing the proposition. Thank you very much for participating in, his, in this initiative. And I'm sure as you are still within the university and in the research innovation system, we'll still be interacting and participating and engaging with you within this project. On that I do, let me not speak too much. Thank you so much. So you good. Let's go. Thanks a lot, colleagues. Cheers. Thank you.